Imagine being able to view data infrastructure as a giant graph and use it to benefit privacy and security. My name is Ken Lin, software engineer at Meta. Today, with my colleague David Tai Yi, we'll share how Meta built a large scale graph for its offline data system and use it for privacy, security, and other use cases. So, what is Meta's offline data systems. Meta operates large-scale offline data systems across data warehousing, stream data processing, and service monitoring and observability. Collectively, they support use cases across analytics, stream data processing, and also service monitoring and operation. They are also important upstream of machine learning. Batch and streaming data are key sources of machine learning features. Enforcing privacy and security and other data management and governance concerns are very important for this data infrastructure because the volume of data, the scale of the system, and the wide, wide variety of use cases. In order to do it effectively, we need to rethink how to represent this vast data and the system and in a way that is understandable, expressible, flexible, and scalable. The high-level idea is to view this infrastructure as a global graph. We use it to map out the system and the assets in the system with unified metadata representation and link the assets by their relationship and the flow of information. Let's take a warehouse as an example. Data warehouse is like a factory of data processing. Pipelines read data and uh, output data. The input data are produced by upstreams. The output data are consumed by the downstreams. Think of a set of pipelines like a room. The inputs are moved in. The outputs are produced within the room. And there's also fine granularity flow of information within the room. In order to establish such a representation, we need to model the data flow as a graph and establish relationships between the assets and represent those assets use generic metadata representation. We call such a graph representation data graph. In today's talk, we'll first share how we build the graph and then share how we apply it to privacy and security problems. We'll close the talk with more use cases. I'll hand over to David to talk about how we build the graph. Thank you, Ken. I'm David Tayeb, and we'll now dive into how we build the data graph. As Ken alluded to, the main idea is to map out all the diverse assets in the warehouse and the data flows as a giant global graph. This will allow us to perform powerful graph analytics at scale and further explore the rich relationship between those assets. It will also enable us to create new visualization that provide new insight into those relationships. Looking at the data model, we want to retain as much important information as possible about each and every asset and each and every flow. For that, we use a simple yet very flexible data model. For the vertices, we store the category of the vertex, which is either an asset or an evidence. And evidence is a process that generated that asset. For the type, we have the class of assets. There's hundreds of class of assets in the warehouse, for example, Hive table or Spark query for, for an evidence. We store an external unique identifier, which uniquely identify in the human readable form using a meta-wide convention consistent across all our internal storage an internal unique identifier, which is a big int for efficient computation, and finally, a metadata, which is the free-form map key-value pairs of attributes that provide contextual information about the vertex. For edges, similarly, we use a type, either a flow or a containment. A containment is a parent-child relationship. A table has multiple columns, for example. A source vertex node, a target vertex node and an evidence node. The evidence represents the process that generated that edge. 
we store the granularity, whether it's table, column, column partition, partition level. And finally, similar to the metadata in the vertex, we, we store the annotation, which is a free form map of attributes, key value pair the same way, that provide contextual information about the edge. So now, what is data graph used for? Well, there is multiple use case. The first one that's most common, it helps answer fundamental questions about the data flow. Does my asset X flow to asset Y, even though X and Y are not directly related? Does asset X contain sensitive data? This type of question, very important, very fundamental. For the discovery and scoping, we want to start from a given set of root nodes that we've carefully identified and create a subgraph of downstreams where we follow the data that has been copied into those downstream nodes. For data understanding, what is the real edge of the data? Are there cumulative cycles? And finally, label propagation, which is a very important use case. Given a set of root nodes, which we carefully labeled with some annotation, we want to propagate those annotations according to a given set of rules. Those rules can be very complicated. So now let's look at how lineage signals are collected. There are mainly four types of signals. Instrumentations, where we go and add the code to our data processors, our compute engines, to call directly the lineage API with very careful informations about what's going on within the data processor. Very, very important. For static analysis, for some data processors are, which are well structured, like SQL processors, we use deep SQL parsing to extract high precision column level lineage. Annotations will go directly into the data pipeline code. Those annotations, high precision annotation, are automatically generated sometimes and reviewed by the, by human expert using a very well defined governance workflow. The last one is log analysis, where we scour all the logs in our, in our runtime components to find those edges that couldn't be found. This is very important for measuring recall and find those unknown unknowns. Let's look at an end-to-end -end workflow. On the left, you have the lineage ingestions. The data flows are collected either from the compute engines, SQL, and so on, or the identity-based access event. And then those events are sent to an interface to be processed and stored into a data graph. In the middle, you have the discovery engine, which is the code that is responsible for traversing that graph. But it also use and fuse the signals from another component, which is the unified asset metadata, which contains a bunch of extra information about the asset. Like for example, user data classification or semantic cl classification. This data is, is fused into an iterative API, which, we, which we're going to explain in a minute, to provide and, and, and create the highest precision and highest coverage possible graph. We wrap this up on the, on the right in the control plane with a standard API for convenience to our users and a, and a set of standard measurement to make sure that the precision and recall comply with a set of requirements. So let's look at a use case study, output closure. Output closure is about understanding how sensitive data flows into our graph so that all the assets in scope can be properly controlled and access controlled. To do that, we really need high precision and high recall. And we built an iterative discovery API to account for the imperfection of the graph. At each iteration, we automatically discover all the assets that are high confidence. And then we stop and we fuse the signals with different sources, the unified asset metadata, the, gra the different granularity, to generate one hop candidate. Those candidates are that sent to for curation, either auto curation with some heuristics that are predefined, or for the most ambiguous cases, we use manual curation when we send to human expert for, for adjudication. So what does the iterative discovery look like? Well, here on the left, you see the first iteration where the graph is grown to a certain extent, and we stop. And then we use the boundary expansion 
to try to find the one hop candidate by fusing those signals. And then we send it for curation. That's the first iteration. Then we rinse and repeat, and we grow the graph using the same methodology once those one hop that we were not sure about have been discovered, and so on and so forth until we've grown the graph to, to, to the entire warehouse. So let's look at a little bit of more privacy-related usage. We talked about output closure, but there's also input closure when we want to prevent sensitive data from entering specific zones. You have retention, we talked about. Data understanding, to, to follow the graph, to try to propagate those semantic annotations. And transitive closure, when we want to answer asset X relate to asset Y, even though they are very far apart. So privacy is only one use case that benefits from data graph. Let's now look at how the data graph can also benefit security with my colleague, Ken Lin. Thanks, David. Just to recap, David just shared how we build the graph and apply it to privacy. The graph idea is not limited to privacy. So here I'll share how we apply it to security. Security of the offline data system is a broad topic, covering areas across building services security, data encryption, and access control and management. Here we'll limit our discussion to access control with a focus on scaling it. Data infrastructure is a collection of data stores, computer engines, and data tools. To scale the access control, we first build the unified metadata representation of all the assets and enrich them with annotation in different dimensions. If you are familiar with attribute-based access control, aka ABAC, this is called Object Attribute Store. We also build unified permission service to make the access control decisions and let the data systems enforce those decisions. In ABAC terminology, the former is called a policy decision point, and the latter is called a policy enforcement points. Here, we use data warehouse as an example, but the principles apply more broadly for other cases. In order to make policy decisions, there are two key components, the data architecture and data annotations. The data architecture models the hierarchical data model of the data warehouse from namespace, table, to column, and subfield. Data annotation enrich the asset with metadata in different dimensions, including semantics, what's the meaning of the data, actor, is that about uh, employee, user, or business, ownership, who is responsible for the data. The data architecture allow us to build a course to find granularity control. And the data annotation allow us to build dynamic controls based on attributes. Over the years, we build control at a different granularity, from namespace to subfield. If you are familiar with Apache Hive, you probably know that a column can be a structure by itself, a practice commonly used at Meta. To support the need, we build the control all the way down to the subfield level. The metadata annotations also enable us to do dynamic access policies. In order to further optimizing the control based on the graph idea, we need to understand how the data is produced, processed, and flows through the system. As previously shared, a data warehouse is a set of pipelines that read from inputs, produce outputs, and the inputs are produced by upstream, and the outputs are consumed downstream. At Meta, we represent a set of pipelines by a concept called the data project, which shares business context and has identity associated with it. From this perspective, the graph is interconnected data processors and its reads and writes. Data processes together with the data form a boundary of data access needs. When operator needs to work on the data, it provides the context and the scope of the data access. Graph is hierarchical in nature. We can drill down and roll up the data processors. 
As previously mentioned, a data processor is a set of pipelines. We are building fine granularity identities, which allow us to zoom in to a smaller section of the graph, establishing finer granularity context. By zooming in, it also enables us to do finer granularity control. This model is not limited to data warehouse or tables. As previously mentioned, the batch and stream data are key sources of machine learning features. We can apply this to machine learning, where the input are features, and the processing are training jobs, and the output are machine learning models. I'll hand it over to David to close the talk. Thank you, Ken. So let's review the three key takeaways from this presentation. First, we discussed how the data graph and unified asset metadata opens new ways of modeling offline data systems and flows. Second, we also discuss how data graph enables us to go beyond individual objects and create boundary, think room in a data factory, and afford us another level of access control. We also discuss how certain aspect of the graph is imperfect. This is due to the heterogeneous scale and the diversity of the system. And to minimize having to make difficult trade-off between coverage and accuracy, we, we saw how it's important to rely on human in the loop. As the quality of the graph gets better over time, this will ultimately translate into a more efficient and automated experience for engineers. So again, why both accuracy and coverage are important? Because simply said, coverage drive compliance and accuracy and usability drive efficiency. Maximizing both is hard, but certainly possible. Going forward, we want to also look at how beyond privacy and security, we, have, we can also use the data graph for more, more classes of problem data corruption recovery, when we want to identify downstream of assets so that they can be backfilled properly. Data ripping, we want to look at which data has not been used for a long time and may be ready for being deleted. Capacity management, we want to optimize data placement based on usage and data pipeline debugging, which uh, looking at the upstream of an asset allow us to a better visibility and debugging capability. So this concludes these talks. Thank you for listening. Merci.